All right. Welcome to another episode of the Cybercognition Podcast. As always, I'm one of your co-hosts, Hutch. I am a innovation principal at Trace3. I am the creator of the Sociosploit blog and also the author of the book, The Language of Deception, Weaponizing Next Generation AI. I'm Len, technical evangelist and transhuman with CyberArk Software, futurist, and this is the Cybercognition Podcast. Yep. Welcome. And today, uh, it, it man, it has been a hell of a week for news. So as always, we're going to jump into the news first. Uh, quite a few different things that have happened on kind of the legal and regulatory front. We're also going to talk about Devin, the first AI software engineer, and then a, a major advance in the space of moving towards physical humanoid robots. Uh, and then from there, we're going to jump into the main segment, segment where we are going to talk about privacy in the digital era. So with that, let's jump into it. Let's go. So first, talking about the news. Lynn, you want to take this one? Uh, I'm going to start with this one. So the U.S. government had commissioned a report on the risks of AI. And uh, honestly, I've just as I just found out, Hutch, you actually had one of the authors uh, on the show in the past. So definitely something to go back and check out. Um, this is essentially trying to shove a genie back into a bottle. You know, basically what we're seeing in this report is basically what everybody's already said. Yes, there is the potential for both coming up with new chemical and biological weapons. There's issues when it comes to cybersecurity and, and cyber attacks. But the for me, the meat and potatoes comes into the when we get down into the recommendations of what to do. So there's, they've looked at this from multiple different facets. There, there's discussions about taking a lot of this from being open sourced and closing and locking down the source code. There's discussions around limiting access to the hardware necessary for advanced AI chips. Uh, there's, they're talking about all kinds of crazy things. Uh, when it comes to research, they want to start throttling how many, how much resources can be put in for everyday use how many how much resources can be used for development and prototyping and i know this is going to be probably one of the more controversial statements i'll say on this show i see this a lot the same way i see gun laws we already have a ton of them if and these are only affecting the people that are going to be trying to access these services and use these types of applications according to the laws. You know, this is essentially the next arms race is the AI. We have a lot of foreign entities that are looking into the same types of technologies and they're not going to be following these types of regulations. So, you know, is providing safety around AI actually going to weaken our national defense against, you know, the same types of attacks that we're trying to contain. Yep. I agree. This is, this is an extremely difficult problem to solve. And I think by far the most challenging part of this commission uh, is, is the recommendations part because uh, well, and as you mentioned, so uh, previously we we had on this podcast Jeremy Harris, who is the lead author of this report. Uh, it was done by Gladstone AI, which is a fantastic team that is doing a lot as far as trying to understand and bring awareness to AI risk. I think that there is some value here. I, I, I think that it is, for one, the fact that this report was commissioned in the first place shows that our federal government is actually starting to take artificial intelligence risk seriously, which I think there's a lot of value in that. I, I think that the the team itself is very well embedded into the artificial intelligence community. They had conversations with some of the leaders in a lot of the different frontier labs. And I think many of the observations that they made are extremely important in the fact that I, I think even the general consensus when you get on the ground and you start integrating with some of the professionals that are working at OpenAI, at Google, at Meta, many of them feel that the capabilities are accelerating far beyond the level of our ability to control these systems, uh, the, the topic of alignment. And so I, I think it's definitely a worthwhile report for looking at. I, I tend to agree with you, Lynn, that the recommendations part is something that requires a lot of discussion here because I, I think there is the concern that if we, from a regulatory perspective, begin to implement 
controls on how big we build our models on uh, how we handle the source code of that and the socialization of those capabilities. It just raises the question of whether or not others are going to do the same. And, and to your point, this is very similar to what we saw with previous weapons proliferation problems as far as weapons of mass destruction. And so I think that I, I'm glad to see that this report is out there. While I, I think there is a lot of debate to be had about the recommendations here, I think if nothing else, that's where we get the value out of this report is that it is going to start conversations about what we should do. And while we may or may not go down some of these paths in terms of the recommendations provided, and while I, I think there's a lot of arguments on both sides of each of those recommendations, uh, at least we're seeing the conversation moving forward. And I think that's a net, net positive. I agree. I'm going to chalk this one up to at least net positive for the exact same reasons. Let's get these conversations started. You know, we can't fix it if we don't fully understand the problem. You know, and, and you know, on that same point, you know, we get the first actual legislation around artificial intelligence. I, I want to hear you tee this one up as, as our, our resident AI, you know, guru here at Touch. What do you think? I think that's similar to what we just talked about on the U.S. side. If we move over to the other side of the prod or pond, we're seeing kind of the same thing. We're seeing uh, a little bit more advanced movement in terms of actual legislation and not just discussions. But at the same time, I think that a lot of what you see whenever you start digging into this legislation is that a lot of it is very vague, that it talks about kind of classifying classifying different AI systems based on risk, but doesn't provide the necessary granularity in order to really make that actionable. And so I, I think, again, kind of the same thing. We're seeing uh, the EU begin to move forward with the discussions. They are creating legislation. And I think very similar to what we saw with GDPR and privacy, the EU is going to lead the charge. We're going to start seeing multinational companies, many of which uh, are headquartered here in the US, or US, but still have to operate there in Europe, that are going to have to start taking considerations of these regulations and at least have, if nothing else, while the granularity doesn't really isn't really there to establish highly prescriptive action, it does require that they are mindful about the way that they're approaching AI risk and that there is some kind of internal standards and regulations at each of these companies related to that. So again, I think still uh, relatively vague, but ultimately probably a net positive. The one thing that I wanted to single in on in terms of the EU uh, AI regulation is the, the fact that they're actually including a, a complete section on transparency. You know, and that was the one piece that I did want to single out in terms of, I agree with you, This, I think this is going to be the very first part of, of legislation that we're going to see, but they're starting. But the one thing that makes me happy is, is they are focusing on transparency. And that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot now. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, man, you're, like I said, you know, if you we want to talk about shoving electronics and circuitry into a human, I, I'm your guy, you're the AI you know, source, source of truth in this conversation. But one of the things that, you know, I did notice, because if, if you look just at the high level, under transparency, they're talking about forcing the disclosure that the content was generated by AI, uh, designating the model to prevent it from generating illegal content, and publishing summaries of copyrighted data used for training. So that was the one that last one. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, the, the data sets that they're using to train these are called weights, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Well, so the, the weights are actually the values that determine the activation of the different neural nodes within the network. Okay. I was going to say, where do we get that? You know, because to my knowledge, and again, I, I'm not 100% focused on, on the AI like you are, we... Is it still ultimately known what OpenAI, Microsoft, what did they use for their initial data sets? And because now we're, as we're seeing all of these copyright laws and things coming out, why don't we see something in there in terms of the transparency about where is the, the data model sourced from? Because the only thing that they're mentioning in that law is just the copyrighted materials. And that was the point. 
Yeah, I, I think that that's something that I would like to see more of as well as disclosure related to what data is being used to train these models. It actually brings uh, my mind to something pretty amusing that happened earlier this week, which was, was Wall Street Journal you were did a that, that was for yep, you. Well, Wall, Wall Street Dur Journal did an interview with the CTO of OpenAI, Mira Murati, and they asked her where the data came from for the new a or OpenAI Sora model. And then they started doubling down on that question and asking, well, was it YouTube? Was it uh, Shutterstock? And, and kind of asked multiple different questions. And with each next question, you just saw Mira kind of closed down a little bit more to the point where she finally is just like, I I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> and it really goes to show just how cagey some of these companies are being. And I think that it also reveals that I think there's some awareness in some of these frontier labs that they really are stepping all over copyrights mm -hmm. as they pull in some of this data and they don't want to bring attention to that. So they are being very non-transparent about what data sources they're using. So I, I think that overall, we're, we're starting to see movement forward where different organizations are establishing partnerships with data sources. So we just recently saw Google establish a partnership with Reddit. Uh, there's mm -hmm. been several other big ones too. Uh, I, I think there's there's some interesting privacy discussions there as and, far as even say, further monetization of our right data, which will- to the meat of our discussion today. So, you know, yep, the only so last we'll... point that I wanted to make on, on the data set point is if we look back to about three weeks ago with what happened with Google and all the woke stuff that was it was spitting out, once again, we need that transparency. And if you're going to claim transparency and try and put that into some type of regulation, we need complete transparency, not just what is copywritten. We need to know everything about where this stuff is coming from. And yep. with that, that is all I have to say on this matter. <laughs> yep, for sure. Uh, the, and of course, the the other interesting regulatory legal matter was uh, Elon Musk has now sued Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI. And uh, I, I will say, and, and I, don't, I probably don't want to dig too deep into this because it really does just become kind of a soap opera, but... <laughs> It is a fascinating soap opera. So if you have the chance to actually read it, and I never thought that I would be recommending to someone to read a legal filing document, but if you read the actual legal filing against Sam Altman, it is fascinating. It has all kinds of interesting nuggets about kind of the origins of open AI, its progress over time and how it's continued to become less and less transparent. And uh, of course, Elon Musk was one of the early and, and one of the biggest initial investors in OpenAI. And really the, the crux of this lawsuit is Elon Musk's feeling that OpenAI has gone to a for-profit for -profit they're, model. They're, right. They're closed AI and for-profit AI. Yep. Instead yep. of doing this for the initial intended benefit of humanity. Yeah, I, I think the one that I like most is it's not open AI, it's profit AI now. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> you know, and especially if you take a look at some of the conversations that even you and I have had in terms of where we see a lot of this going into the tiered data model structures and, you know, the, the, the GPT stores. I mean, come on, if you, you got Elon Musk coming after you, this, this is going to be, like you said, this is going to be the technical soap opera of the summer. Yep. And a, a couple other interesting things that came out of this. So one was that uh, it seems like there was further validation of the early Reuters leaks that claimed that OpenAI had created this even more powerful algorithm called QSTAR and were leveraging that to move even closer to the concept of artificial general intelligence or AGI. And actually just this past week, we had a paper that was released called Quiet Star, which was released by several Stanford researchers. And it's uh, obviously with Stanford being at the heart of Silicon Valley, and, and there's essentially a pipeline between Stanford University and all of these frontier labs. It's 
not hard to imagine that there is going to be a lot of conversations going back and forth between Stanford grads and these frontier labs. So while it was released by Stanford and not OpenAI, it seems like this quiet star paper may be pointing to exactly what OpenAI had discovered. And if you look into this paper, what it's doing is it is, so the Q star, of course, in this case, is quiet self-taught reasoning. And it essentially is taking the concept of chain of thought prompting, which is something that we've already found dramatically improves the capabilities of large language models. So instead of just having them execute on a response, it will have it reason out, uh, out loud. And then through that reasoning, we'll come to a conclusion of the best way to handle a specific output. And they've already found that that easily doubles the performance of these large language models. So what QSTAR does is it basically found, they found a way to essentially convert the system into a reinforcement model where they do essentially something very similar to that chain of thought prompting, a kind of reasoning to try to project based on that reasoning what the most likely next sequence of words are. And then it reinforces reasoning that arrives at those same conclusions. So we're essentially creating this reinforcement engine that is positively reinforcing rational capabilities rather than just autocomplete like we've done before. And that itself is kind of terrifying. It really is moving away from what has been relatively easy to dismiss up until this point as just a very powerful autocomplete engine to something that potentially is more than that. Stay tuned. Yep, for sure. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, another fascinating thing that happened this week. Um, oh. so, so a company called Cognition AI has come out of stealth and has announced their new AI software engineer, Devin. And it has its ent entire own workspace. And so rather than just kicking out suggestions for boilerplate code, like you see with GitHub Copilot, what this is able to do is you basically give it a project that you want it to complete. It will reason through and decide the best way for it to complete that project. It has an entire workspace of its own. So it has a command line interface terminal, it has a, a scripting engine, it has its own browser, and it uses all of this to go from one end to the other and complete these entire projects. And if you watch some of the videos that these guys have published, which no doubt are probably cherry picked to some extent, though it'll be interesting to see to what extent this actually lives up to the hype, but the videos are extremely impressive. I mean, it shows it working through relatively complex issues. Like one of the things, if you've ever done any kind of machine learning yourself, a challenge that you'll frequently run into is if you're using GPU processing, NVIDIA drivers are not the easiest thing to deploy whenever you're trying to execute machine learning operations across a GPU cluster. And this actually, they have a video of it stepping through and doing troubleshooting of some of the GPU driver issues until it actually starts executing on its own AI training runs. And so this is the point where we, we talk about that exponential curve where you really see the hockey stick take off is where you finally have AI now training and creating AI. You know, I've, I've said in multiple episodes, you know, especially looking forward, what, what are the software engineers of the future look like? What do the hackers of the future, you know, what do they look like? Are they people like me and you who are going to go through classes or are they going to be people who are going to spend more time in libraries, expanding their vocabularies, and then basically being thrown a project and your whole purpose is going to be to just tell this thing what you want. Yeah. You know, I, it, I, I, so I think, yeah, I, I think our, our next generation of software engineers. So I, I don't think this totally replaces good quality software engineers, because I think what we're probably going to see is it probably will do exceptionally well with, uh, relatively routine stuff. And I, I think we're likely going to see that its capabilities increase over time. But I think you, you're basically going to have a software engineer manager who is managing multiple 
instances of this system that is running multiple different R&D projects in parallel. And that software engineer only steps in when it runs into an issue. And of course, you can actually step into its workspace and help it work through those issues when it runs into it. But you're but, basically the escalation point. You have your tier one AI developers and yeah. now. And, and to that there. point, you know, we can, I think we can both attest to the fact that, you know, if you don't use these types of skills on a daily basis, you will atrophy. You know, it, it doesn't work. Take somebody that, you know, is, you know, I'm going to, I'm not even going to go into the offensive security world. Let's take somebody who was writing SQL queries and things, and then you, you put them into another department for seven months and then put them back. They still are going to have the fundamentals, but let's be real. And let's look at the human psychology of this. They're, they're going to be doing a whole lot of Google whenever they come back, right? Right. But let's look at the human psychology of this. Cause the one part about after look, reading all the paperwork on Devin was like, we work good in a, in a team environment. Let's think about that for just a minute. You know, up until now, what are the, the main collaborative software that's, that everybody uses for, for software development? Git, some kind of Git, you know, you yep. can fork, you can branch. Okay. So let's think about this. I'm now in a position where all I'm doing is telling the machine what I want. From a profitability, from a corporate standpoint, as long as the stuff keeps coming out, going out the door, you know, that's my, that's my end product, you know? So the idea of even the fact that they're putting this out there is that you, you can, we can integrate with your current design team. Well, realistically, if you're going to do all the coding, what do I need a design team for anymore? So, you know, it almost seems counterproductive for a long term if we're going to start relying on code that not only is going to write code, but going to analyze and learn from its own code and especially in whatever form or fashion that you're using for your specific purposes, why do I need a team anymore? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think that this is, we're definitely, this is the start of seeing some of that employment disruption because while I don't think this is outright, at least not now, going to replace software engineers, well, yet. It, def it definitely limits the number of software engineers you need because I can handle all of the low hanging fruit. I can have a bunch of projects running in parallel and basically just have one person that's there to intervene. And that person does need to have some base skills, but just there to intervene when things go sideways. And otherwise, I mean, you you have one person that can do the work of an entire team. But but look, let's look at how that that's worked out for standard system admins over the years. I mean, I'm sure there may be some small mom and pop shops out there, maybe some, some smaller corporate or enterprise level type companies. But when was the last time you saw a dedicated Windows administrator or a dedicated Linux administrator? We've moved to virtualization. We've moved to containerization. We don't need those types of administrators anymore because we don't, we've moved to a disposable type of an environment. Yeah, infrastructure is code and it's all automated. Exactly. So if we get to the point where code is code, I mean, that's realistically what we're talking about. You know, at what point down the road does this then become a negative return for current existing developers? Especially if a lot of this, you know, this is the first of many. We, we've seen what's going to happen once th this stuff starts coming out. You're going to see different branches of... You know, maybe it's not going to be Devin. We, you, you know, we're going to start seeing more code that's using LLMs AI to actually become the new coders. Period. Yep. It's uh, I, I, I mean, we we are going to start seeing dramatic shifts, and I, I think that it is, it, it's really going to test our society's ability to adapt. I think it, in a professional capacity and, and I think in a social capacity as well. And that's one of the reasons why I was saying, yeah, let's look at just the, the, the human psychology side of these things, you know, and, and we can take one, kind of a half a step forward or backward, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. But the, the more this stuff continues to move, we are going to, at some point, 
get to where the I'm trying to think of how I want to say this because I don't want to sound like I, 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 I'm, you know, the complete doomsay, doomsayer, you know, but I mean, at what point do we no longer know what we're actually dealing with anymore, period? I mean, just take it from a code perspective, and we. Yeah, I mean, if we 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 take we take away the jobs that have that are enjoyable that people love to do, and then I, I guess are are you getting at kind of what what is our value? What are we contributing to the world? Bingo. If, yeah. I mean, yeah. and even from just a simple standpoint of, you know, I I don't know about you, but I remember the very first program that I ever wrote from start to finish that worked. You know, after debugging obviously nobody can write perfect code the first time but you know that feeling of accomplishment and the fact that i knew every bit of code in there i knew every function i knew every routine we're now just giving things up to the machines you know and how many people are honestly going to do a very thorough extensive code review of what comes out or are you just going to look and make sure that everything works and accept the fact that the debugging and the security checks from the the ai did the job for you yeah, I, th I think you're right. We're largely probably going to get to a it's good enough point. And like you said, people's skills are going to atrophy. They're not going to be as actively using it. They're going to be spending more of their time managing the robots than actually doing the code. And uh, yeah, I, I think overall, we, we likely will see some quality issues resulting from this. I, I think then we're going to need more controls for that and more complexity in the system. And I really... You know, I'm going to throw this out there. I, I, I just pray that, you know, the, the, the laws of robotics somehow, you know, from Isaac Asimov, make their way into all of the AI LLMs, you know, and, and this is my final wish. Can we just please make sure do no harm, don't allow us to be harmed, and, you know, let's, let's keep on walking down the road. Yeah, for sure. Get, get some kind of alignment in there, right? Amen. Well, uh, speaking of... Mm -hmm. the uh the emerging ai apocalypse um i mean it's it's hard to not be a little bit concerned about how fast this is moving so of course open ai partnered with a company in what i think was if i recall correctly it was it was a multi-billion dollar investment i think it was a little over two billion dollars so uh, well, a lot of times when you talk about some of these smaller ai startups you're looking at uh maybe a couple hundred million. So a two billion is a pretty sizable investment for something. Uh, and these guys basically are partnering with OpenAI in order to create a humanoid robot that is able to use the the transformer architecture in ways to actually inter interact with the physical world and and i think this is kind of building on a couple of different things so one uh, a little over a year ago google released a paper on the rt1 transformer which was basically their proof that the transformer architecture could be very effectively used for robotics and the biggest challenge that we had was just the lack of data so unlike image generative models or text generative models, there's not just terabytes of data that you can scrape off the internet when you talk about kinetic robotic data. You have to actually go out of your way to create that. And so once that paper came out, I think a lot of different leading labs started doing just that. They started generating data. Actually, if you look at uh, some of the the job posts now, companies like Tesla and some of the other autonomous driving vehicle companies are now hiring people just to drive around because they need to generate that action data in conjunction with the sensor data. And so uh, we've got kind of the, the proof that transformers do work very well with robotics. And now we have the timeline. It's been a little over a year. We're building that data out. And then also what's been interesting is since the Sora model released, which was OpenAI's text to video model, it kind of proved out that if you approach the encoding of visual data in uh, a spatial temporal way, and you do that correctly over a time series, you can have this emergent property of the machines kind of inherently learning real world physics. And so, of course, that was also out of OpenAI, who is closely partnered with Figure One. And then this past week, Figure One releases this video of this humanoid robot that is 
interacting with all kinds of different objects in front of them, multitasking, interacting with some objects while also at the same time explaining its reasoning for how it performed the last task. Uh, what I didn't see in this was any kind of mobility. So it it was moving around and interacting with objects, but it wasn't walking through space. So I don't know how far they are with that, but just the combination of its reasoning capability with the different interactions of items that were during the presentation moved around in front of it and changed location uh, and, and just knowing the underlying technology that this isn't hard-coded robotic action or actions that this thing is generalizing and interpreting and interacting with the real world is i mean this this shows us that we are probably a year yes. maybe two away from these humanoid systems yep starting to be among us oh my god this absolutely terrifies the hell out of me absolutely we're right because I mean, we we both come from the hacking world and this is hackable this is this is a machine this is something that i guarantee you some if not me somebody is getting into the brain of this thing i promise you you know but what it, it, this just blew my my mind I mean, and I agree with you. This is at the beginning of a very long and complicated road. But to key off of one of the things that, that you said, you know, the question that was given to this machine was, I'm hungry. And on the table was a plate, an apple, and a glass. And the fact that it was able to recognize the object that was the only edible object and present it. It was also able to pick up relatively flat objects like the plate. This to me is phenomenal tech, but once again, and I've said this about the LLMs, I've said it about AI, I've said it about every emerging technology up until, you know, up to date, and I'll probably continue to say it as long as I'm in this field. Show me how you're securing this. You know, I don't want to see the bells and whistles. Show me how this is safe. You know, iRobot is one of my favorite movies for multiple reasons. But we, like I just said, we don't have those laws. This, this machine, and I'm not going to call it a robot. This machine is going to do whatever is within its parameters. But once again, we don't know the parameters. I love the fact that we're moving forward, but we, I, I, I'm going to be the guy that's going to get up on the, on the soapbox and just scream, don't show me this, show me everything. Yep. And, and I think what's interesting, you mentioned iRobot and kind of the problems around alignment. And what was interesting about iRobot, which was a, a little bit of a departure from some of the other works that Isaac Asimov did, was that it had the same laws of robotics that you saw in several of his other books, but it also acknowledged kind of the, the general problem of the difficulty of alignment because the very plot of iRobot was that Isaac Asimov's laws of robotics became, uh, because of the ambiguity, it became essentially the justification for how the machine decided that it was going to start taking over humanity. And again, I, I think we start looking back at Asimov and just how much foresight he had into what's going forward, because that's exactly the problem that we're having, is we interface with these machines now with human language. Human language is very vague and ambiguous, and it is subject to interpretation. And when you try to regulate a system with that kind of vagueness and ambiguity, they're you're, you're going to inevitably run into problems. Absolutely. I, I'm going to be watching this, you know, but the fact that it, this to me just tells me we are a lot closer to that humanoid style artificial. Again, I don't want to call it a robot because I, I think that is a little dated. You know, but this is the beginning. And if you can, if it, I agree, this is uh, just like the last thing. I'm sure they probably cherry picked some of these demos and some of this functionality, but it shows that it works. And if it, this works, 
even if it has to sit there and it has to think for, you know, a few seconds to interpret, you know, interpret with the vision field and the request. I remember being on a 14 form modem, you know, downloading an MP3 for, for nine hours once, you know, it, it, everything starts somewhere. And, and this is both fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. Agreed. All right. With that, we want to jump over to the main segment, talk Let's about some privacy it. issues. All right. So obviously privacy is increasingly becoming more and more of a challenge in the digital era. And as we continue to interconnect our lives with all of these different computing capabilities throughout that process, we have systems, we have organizations that are continuing to aggregate more and more data on us. And there becomes more and more concerns about the disclosure of that data to unauthorized parties. Um, I, I think one of my favorite documentaries on some of the challenges related to privacy in the digital era, and admittedly, this was actually pre or I guess prior to a lot of the latest generation artificial intelligence capabilities, but it was a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And this comes back to some of the concepts that we were talking about in a previous episode where I, I think it was our idiocracy episode where we talked about digital dependency and the fact that a lot of these social network platforms are extremely addictive and we talked about that problem but i don't think we talked so much about what the end game is of these organizations why they are deliberately making these platforms so addictive and and that is largely because of the fact that Money. you are the product you are the product so we it's Money. that age-old adage that if you are not paying for a product, you are the product, and they are digitalizing, and they are creating a profile around your identity to sell that off to the highest bidder. And it's not just them. You know, I, I love the fact that you, you we, we entitled this, you know, Privacy in the Digital Age, because in my opinion, there is none. We have none, and, and we've all accepted that. You know, we, we all- Part of those terms and conditions, right? We all carry the biggest spy around with us every single place we go. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an Android guy. I, I'm pretty sure I, if I remember you're an Apple, you know, but we, ha I've got the, the Google timeline. I think Google knows everywhere I, that phone goes. I can, and I love the, the, the snapshots. This is the ones where anytime I, I, I want to have that false sense of security, like I'm doing my own thing. You know, you get those pop-ups, your timeline five years ago, you were in here. Would you like to see pictures? Yep. We have no privacy. And, and the truth is, is we've given it away for convenience. We have. Yeah. I mean, we, not a single one of us reads the terms of services on these things and every single one of them, I'm sure to some extent is disclosing how much data they're aggregating on you. I mean, for regulatory reasons, they have to, but we all just flip through it and accept, accept. You're, I mean, you're exactly right. We've, we've given up. We have accepted that privacy is a convenience that we are willing to sacrifice for the digital capabilities that we're now given. Oh, I mean, you know, we, we, you and I were talking right before this episode started about the fact that, you, you know, if the big thing in the news right now, you know, and, and this is just the latest in a number of these, but, you know, there was a data breach with Roku. And one of the things that you, I, I agreed with you, this is not something like you saw what, what happened with MGM and Caesars and, and Scattered Spider and some of these, you know, nation state attacks. This only affected 15,363 accounts. And if it wasn't for the fact that we have forced disclosure laws here in the United States, nobody would know. But, hey. but what I was going to say is, what does that really matter? You know, these particular accounts, you know, that, that the hackers were able to access, you know, account stored financial information, subscriptions, account names, and real, not real names and addresses. But let's be honest, we give that stuff away on maybe not the financials, but we give all the rest of that away on our own social media pages. Yeah, a lot of it. And and I think we've, we've become completely numb to this. I, I, I think part of it is the fact that, like you said, we've accepted that privacy is is no longer something that we have but i i think also when you talk about the hacking breaches 
I remember a time, and it, and it wasn't that long ago. We talk about a decade ago. If a company was had a significant data breach, that was potentially a nail in the coffin. That was possibly the end of that company. It was that a question of will this company could be a company killer? Yeah, exactly. And now we've gotten so numb to it, we just accept that this is going to be frontline or front page news. And I can tell you that uh, the number of times that I have gotten disclosures that my data has breached, and I would imagine this is the case with everybody, I have got enough free credit monitoring and free identity theft monitoring options out there that I could live on it for the rest of my life because of the fact that all of that data from 20 plus providers that I have has been disclosed to the entire world. And, and the thing is, is once it's out there, especially if it gets out on any of these type of dark net identity markets, it's not going away. This is not like, you know, an NFT where I have the original one and I have the only one. No, I can sell your information seven, 800 times as, as many times as somebody's willing to buy it. You know, I said a long time ago, and, and this is me putting my, my, my profit hat on for just a quick second the technical profit, you know, the idea of auto insurance or homeowners insurance or renters insurance, you know, this is such a common thing that, you know, is pretty much globally. But I do believe that we are moving towards a point in time where the idea of having your own identity insurance against things like digital privacy breaches is going to become just as common. I really do. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I think in, in some higher profile or more financially sensitive operations, we're already seeing that. I mean, you think about uh, you now are required if you're going to get a mortgage to have title insurance. And that's because of identity theft issues where people will defraud people out of homes that are anywhere. I mean, it can be any price. Hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars millions. where they could they could easily lose that in just a moment's time because somebody is able to fraudulently claim that they are they are the authorized owner of that title and you know and and if you know you, you look at the term for anybody out there that hasn't ever looked up the term osint before it, it's one of my favorite toys you know open source information technology you know, we give away 99 percent of all of this stuff just through our our everyday use on the internet you know i how many times have you to, to, to Hutch's point, you know, when you're filling out a form online, how many times have you actually stopped and looked at the information that they're asking for? You know, we talk about digital privacy and breaches, but, you know, if I'm signing up for, if I'm at my hardware store, what do they need to know about, you know, my, my parent, you know, why do they need to know where I live, where, where my parents live? You know, everybody everywhere wants more information because to your point, you know, if you take a look back at the, what happened with Cambridge Analytica during the last presidential cycle and just the way that all of that information was, was weaponized for political purposes, we're much better than we were back in 2016. You know, 2016. You, you say we're much better. I, I think that we have more. I, I meant I, much I, better I, at getting data. Yeah, okay. <laughs> me, I'm talking about the criminals, man. The, 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 and the companies that are also aggregating all this data against Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting because we historically in, I, I, I think you go back a couple decades, we had the problem with uh, overly powerful intelligence. And I, I think that that was largely the consequence of us being willing to empower our intelligence agencies more post 9-11. And then, of course, the Snowden leaks came out. There was a little bit more awareness about how much abuse was going on in government intelligence. And I think we've largely gotten to the point where the federal government and likely other governments that are heavy into surveillance have probably realized that they no longer have to even do these intelligence operations. They can just subpoena the data from all of these private companies that are aggregating these insane amounts of data from us. Well, And, and I'm even going to go one step further. I, I, I want to say it was either Ring or Nest, and, and I'm not slamming either one. You know, but there was a point where one of them was actually working with local law enforcement and providing footage from these doorbell cameras to the authorities without any type of search warrant. You know, so again, even when you think 
you've got your own mailbox or excuse me, doorbell camera. You think that that's yours, but you're storing it in a cloud that's owned by somebody else. Yep. And, and every single one of these companies has different, and it's, it's actually fascinating to see that the levels of pushback, because some companies have a better reputation of pushing Absolutely. back on government mandates that they hand over data. There's others that will go silently and just hand it over without a problem, or even proactively like like some of these digital doorbell cables or cameras. Um, yeah, but to I, that point, you know, for anybody that's not familiar with them, I, I, I don't get any kickbacks, but one of the organizations that I think falls right in line with today's conversation is EFF. If you've never actually dealt with EFF, you know, actually wearing one of their, their hoodies right now, they are all about tech advocacy and law. And these, this is an organization that fights for digital privacy online. So a, a big shout out to EFF. If you're not familiar with them, definitely give them a, a look up online, give them some support because they're there fighting for your rights and your privacy. Yeah, I agree. It's a great group. I've, I've followed them for a long time and, and been a contributor as well. Um, so I, I think it's also interesting to, to look at how things have transformed just in the last few years with the large language models and the direction that we're going. And I, I think that there's a t couple of different privacy concerns that come out of these as well. So of course, for one, we've got the surveillance capitalism problem and that was uh, again kind of goes back to that the social dilemma that we have all of these private companies that are aggregating all of this data on us for the sake of monetizing that data but i think now what's fascinating is the data that's now being acquired we mentioned earlier the partnership between Google and Reddit and how there's all of these different partnerships now with AI companies that are purchasing data from all of these different conversational platforms. And what's fascinating is we're moving away from an era where it used to be that the data that was desirable was metadata about you. Mm -hmm. It was what demographics do you fit in? Are you conservative or liberal? Are you older or younger? are you what race are you what gender are you uh a, a lot of it was just kind of details about you it was feature sets but now with these large language models and they these want image generation everything models, they, they, they want, want to know everything. what sites you were on how long you were there what links you clicked on how much time did you spend did you go down a rabbit hole they are you know, this goes well, back to and, and even the conversations, like the content of those conversations oh, yeah. is pulled into these models and trained on. You know, we talked about some of my research in the past, the synthetic identity. You know, I was able to use essentially, you know, open AI's chat GPT and created an entire data set on myself was actually able to fish every self-service recovery portal question answer just out of the data set I was able to collect by doing Google searches on myself. Yeah, and for, and, anybody and, that wants, and for anybody that wants to use that information and try and hack me, I've already changed all. Of, I'm the first guy that says if if the bad guys know what your answers are, don't use those answers. So good luck. <laughs> so I and this is a fascinating. You mentioned OSINT earlier, uh, and OSINT, of course, is there are extremely powerful capabilities in some of these newer generative AI models that can enable intelligence gathering in ways that were was never possible before. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating was a few months ago, uh, OpenAI released the multimodal version of GPT-4. And I remember when it came out, the somebody, well, I guess, I guess take it back to, to old computer vision problems. When uh, a decade ago, when we were doing early computer vision, there was this uh, amusing, use case for computer vision that was chihuahua versus muffin and it was basically close-up images of chihuahuas look very similar to blueberry muffins and it was actually a very challenging problem for computer vision systems to solve and what somebody showed shortly after the release of gpt4's multimodal capability was a prompt where they passed it the the matrix, the, the different grid of different chihuahua and muffin photos and asked it to break down in each of those different grid squares what it sees and flawlessly was able to step through this problem. And, and I thought that was fascinating that we 
hadn't deliberately trained this GPC-4 model for image recognition, but just as a byproduct, as an emergent property of scaling it up and giving it this image data, it was able to so effectively execute on this task. And so it made me think of another similar problem that I had seen in the past, which was Zizek versus Hamill. So it turns out that the American actor, Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, Skywalker. in Star Wars, looks remarkably similar when unkempt and hasn't properly shaved to Slava Zizek, who's a Slovenian philosopher. And so there was the same thing. There was a grid with different pictures of each of them. And it's basically like, pick out the Mark Hamels. And so I, I actually did the exact same prompt. I threw this into GPT-4 and I basically asked it in each of these different grid blocks, what do you see? And it started telling me, I can't help you with that. So oh my gosh, I, he does look, they do they, look they similar. Do, <laughs> they look very off. similar. Yep. So uh, so I asked it to, to identify kind of who each one of these are. It says, I can't do that. And so I started researching why GPT-4 would participate in Chihuahua versus Muffin, but it would refuse to participate in Zizek versus Hamill. And it turns out, and this I feel like was not nearly publicized well enough, but it turns out that OpenAI actually delayed the release of the multimodal version of GPT-4 for about six months to address a very serious problem that they found. And that is that GPT-4 recognizes people. Think about the fact that this thing is trained on the entirety of internet image data with text descriptions that are appended to those. We already know that they're stepping all over copyright and just scraping things from social media and wherever else they can find it. And it turned out that in early testing and red team testing of the system, you could basically take a photo of a random person in the supermarket and say, who is this? And if that person had any presence on the internet, GPT-4 could be like, hey, this is this person. That is, so what's fascinating about this is that Meta, or of course Facebook at the time, if you recall like five, maybe 10 years ago, they used to have that feature on Facebook where if you uploaded a photo, it would kind of surround somebody's face and they'd say, is it this person? Right, and they, yep, and, and they, they had that facial recognition system and people thought that it was so creepy that Zuckerberg, and Zuckerberg does not have a great track record for privacy, but even Zuckerberg was like, this is creepy. We're gonna do away with this whole facial recognition capability. And so now, while tech execs intentionally stepped away from deliberately creating facial recognition software, we now have, again, as an emergent property, unintentionally, just by virtue of scaling the system and feeding it all of this data, we now have nation state level facial recognition I that exists in the sure system. This one, one jailbreak away. I was going to say, the authorities are... are are looking for hackers right now to figure out how to hack that prompt. I'm telling you, because you, you give any government, military, or police department the ability to ID anybody. That's we, we talk well, about I don't, money. I don't even there's money. I don't even know if I don't even know if they're trying to find people to bypass the prompt. I mean, I, I think we're already seeing a lot of collusion between the State Department, the federal government, and open AI. I mean, the we we talked about this, yeah, I think a, a few months ago the fact that open ai opened up their or uh, updated their terms of service and removed yeah. any kind of restrictions around military or warfare use and so to me that suggests that there's already conversations between the federal government and open ai about how they can make use of this platform so it begs the question i mean are they getting a foundational model that doesn't have any of those safeguards no. and are able to use it for these purposes and then the, the the only follow up question to that is how do we get our hands on one? <laughs> well, and I I think that we are uh, beginning to already see nation states that are attempting to gain access to the weights and uh, the the libraries and the data models weights and, and weights and biases and the configurations yeah. of these models and so I I think it's only a matter of time where we either see open source groups that build one that's big enough that it has comparable capabilities. I mean, we know that compute goes down in cost and becomes more capable over time. So it's not hard to imagine that two to three years down the road, open source models may be just as capable as GPT-4 is now. So I, I, think, I think just naturally it's going to become available in the hands of regular people. And then of course, there's also the question of people breaking into and gaining access to OpenAI's networks or Google's networks and gaining access to the 
weights and biases and the configurations of these systems to be able to replicate them offline and have those same capabilities. So this is the future that we're looking at is basically um, emergent scale capabilities in large AI systems where they they know exactly who you are. They know everything about you. And again, this is all just just a product of scaling of these systems. It's and, terrifying. And, and taking that as an opportunity to circle back to the main topic itself. So I, I'm going to kind of close out with my opening statement. You know, we talk about privacy in the digital age. We have given that up for a handful of technical beans. We have. Yep, for the for the shiny next thing, we've given up all of those rights. No, that's not to say, you know, do the best you can, but realize the only way that you can honestly deal with removing any access is you're going to have to go off grid, lose all your tech and live like a hermit in the wilds of Alaska somewhere. And, and I think that's where we're at is we are now at a point where it's not a matter of trying to safeguard your privacy in the digital age. It's really, it is a choice between do I live in the digital age or do I have privacy? And those two things have pretty much become mutually exclusive. It is one I or the agree. other. You cannot have both. You cannot have both. And, and unfortunately, I wish there was a, a better solution or a better answer that we could provide. But I, I think that's that's about it. If you if you want privacy, get off Unplug the grid. Yep. completely. And, and keep in mind that also means no smart appliances in your house. You're going to have to get a car that was probably made sometime back in the 1970s. But you'll probably be safe if the EMPs happen. Touche. Touche. All right. Well. This has been a great conversation. A uh, pleasure as always. Um, so uh, until next that, time, any final, any final words, Lynn? Good luck. We're all going to need it. <laughs> yep, for sure. All right. With that, Cybercognition over and out. Cheers. Peace.